is our heart. Listen to your pastor's heart. If you're brand new here, you belong here. It's not by accident that you showed up today. Some of you are like, wait a minute, my friend brought me. Guess what? They brought you because they believe in you. And as your pastor, I believe in you. I believe in this place. I believe this is the place for miracles. How many believe that today? Come on now. But I believe this is the place where we find the missing part of our lives. Some of us are like, there's a missing piece. You know what the missing piece is? It's the church. Look at that person next to you. Come on, look at somebody on the, on the, look down the row, just down the row. Look at the person at the end of the row, if you can see them. Yeah, nod at them. Guess what? You need them. They need you. We need each other. We are so much better together. Do you believe that? Come on, put your hands if you have to believe that. That's why we're the church. And, and, and I'm going to steal something from my wife's message last week. If you were here last week, were you here last week? Did you just enjoy her? She's going to preach a whole lot more around here, I'm telling you. Woo. But, but she made a statement in her message. She said, family's not perfect, but family's God's plan. And I believe that God gave me a message for today before I, I heard her preach it. But the message is this. Community is not perfect, but community is God's plan. This is why we're here together. We're not here to punch a clock and say, God, I want to go to heaven, so I'm going to go to church. It's not our religious duty that we do. You know why we're here? We're here for that person on the end of the row. We're here for the person in the next section over there. Come on, we're here because we're together. Can you put your hands together? Come on now. You might think, well, well, pastor, I really don't think that I belong here. I want to encourage you. I've been, have you ever been in a place where you felt like you didn't belong? Hello? I've been in places where I've dressed like this and everybody else is in a suit and I go, I don't think I belong. You know what I'm saying? I think I got the wrong, the wrong message about the wardrobe. And then they're like, no, we want you to dress like that. I mean, I've been in real uptight, stuffy places where they're like, you, you're, everyone's like, what is he wearing? And then they find out that I'm speaking and they're like, oh, look what you're wearing today. I like that skinny jeans on you. They're, they're getting nice, you know, before they're looking at me like, you're crazy. If you've been in a place where you feel like you don't belong, I'm telling you, today, you need to realize one thing. You belong here. If your life is messed up, if you got issues, and some of us have more than issues, if you got stuff going on in your life and you don't have any answers, guess what? You belong here. If you've been saved for a long time and you're still struggling with the same sin and still struggling with temptation, guess what? You belong here here. You got to celebrate a little bit. Why? Because sometimes we think, well, I got to be perfect. I got to measure up. No, Jesus came for messed up, broken humanity. And guess what? Ain't nobody perfect in this world. Yeah, I use bad English. Ain't nobody perfect in this place. Everyone's welcome because we believe that when Jesus shows up, anything's possible. Do you believe that today? So we've got to realize that I, I, and have a greater revelation that that whenever I feel messed up, whenever I feel awkward coming to church, you know, there's those awkward moments when you're in church where the pastor's like, hold hands with the person next to you, and then he forgets. I do that to people. Sometimes I do it on purpose. I'm like, let's make it as awkward as we possibly can. You know what I'm saying? Whenever you feel awkward in church, guess what? You belong here. Whenever you walk through the door and you listen and people sing, and you're like, I don't know if they're singing on key or off key, but they're singing loud. And, and you're like, I don't think I could do that. I don't even think I could reach up. He said, reach up. I don't even think I could do that. And the reason why I don't think I can do that because I know what I did last week. I know what I did this morning. I know what I did last night. You're thinking about that. Guess what? You still belong here because God's got a plan for your life. Do you believe? Come on now, help some people out around you. So today, community is not perfect, but community is is God's plan. And we're going to read out of Genesis chapter 39 and just give you a little, a little bit of um, context of what happens in the story. This is the story of Joseph. And if you've not read the story of Joseph, I want to encourage you to go home um, this week and read chapter 37, 38, and 39. Because in chapter 37, Joseph has a dream. And he tells his brothers, hey, I've got a dream, and my dream is you're going to bow down to me, you know. And they're like, who in the world are you? You know, he's the younger kid in the family, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you know, you, you, you're trying to, like, bow up at me. I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest. You're not supposed to have these kind of dreams. And they hated him, the Bible says, and they wanted to kill him. That is messed up on every level for someone to get mad at someone because they think that they got this dream that came from God. 
can I help you? Let's just stop right there. Some of you, God will give a dream. And there's somebody in your family that will not appreciate the dream that God gave you. And they will speak negatively about their dream. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to kill that dream that God's given your life. For some of you, your dream is to be whole. For some of your dream is to have kids. For some of your dream is to have a family. For some of your dream is to, is to own a home. For some of your dream is, is simply just to, to, just to be whole in every way. And, and, and you hold on to that and some people say, I don't know if that can happen. And they're like, well, I hope it does. Guess what? I don't hope it does. I know it does because faith in Jesus changes everything. So you need to tell the dream killers in your life to... to um, let's not go there. <laughs> Just tell them to take a chill. Oh, let's go on. Okay. Because uh, there's always someone that wants to kill your dream. I'm telling you, when I had a dream, I wanted God to do something in my life. I didn't know what it was. I told my grandmother, she is the meanest person on the planet. My grandmother, not yours. It's okay. But but she's not living today. But, but she said, you want to go to Bible college? She said, you want to nothing of your life. Nobody will listen to you. You will be nothing. And I wanted to look at I went, hey, grandma. Let me go, hey, grandma. Look at what God did in my life. I looked down for a reason. Some of you understand what I just did. Because I remember praying at grandma's bedside when she passed and asking grandma for nothing, but just to pray with her. And grandma pointing a finger at me and saying, you will not pray for me. I do not believe. Listen, that's, that, that, that hurt, but I said, hey, from this point on, my family shall be saved. My family shall go to heaven. I'm going to pray them into heaven. Hallelujah. Some of you have been struggling with your dream is that your family gets saved. Someone's dream is that your parent gets saved. Someone's dream is that somebody that, that lives in your house would get saved. And this message today may just be for you because what's on your life is what makes a difference in the people around you. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph has a dream. He, his brothers want to kill him. Chapter 38, his dad sends him out to check on the brothers, and they're like, hey, here comes the dreamer. We're going to take him out. They strip him of his robe, throw him in a hole, and then they sit around and eat dinner and go, who's going to kill him? How are we going to kill him? What are we going to do? And then they realize, wait a minute, why kill somebody? We can make money off of it. You know, it was, a, it was capitalism at its best. And they said, let's just sell him. So this band of Ishmaelites come along, and they're like, they sell him off as a slave and then they take his coat and they dip in blood and bring it to dad and say hey I guess a wild animal ate him he's gone and in the background they're like yes he's gone you got to read the whole story because he's never gone hello he was sold because God had a greater plan what you're walking through right now may be the perfect opportunity for God to do something great in your family Maybe the perfect opportunity for something miraculous to happen. Look in Genesis chapter 39. Now, when we read the story, I want you to notice one person. Yeah, you're going to see Joseph. But I want you to notice a man by the name of Potiphar and what happens to Potiphar. Verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, he was the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed, the Lord blessed, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except for the food he ate. Today, I don't want you to worry about the food that you eat after the service because we got pulled pork and hot dogs. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on now. But he didn't, I mean, can you imagine getting to the place in life where you don't have to worry about nothing? You don't have to worry about your laundry. You don't have to worry about the yard. You don't have to worry about work. You don't have to worry about where it's coming from. All you got to worry about is what in the world am I going to eat today? You know what I'm saying? There's a whole lot of things that could be on the menu, and there's a whole lot of things I want. I mean, can you imagine? This is what we're talking about is an Egyptian ruler who 
Ishmaelites sell this guy off and sell him so that they could have profit. He's blessed because of someone that lived in his house. Today, I want you to realize something real simple. That your breakthrough is found in community. What God wants to do suddenly in your life is what he does in a room like this. What God does suddenly around you, guess what? It starts in you because Jesus didn't save you just to fill a seat. There ain't a whole lot of seats left today. Guess what? He didn't save you just to fill a seat. He saved you to change the community. He saved you to make a difference in somebody around you. So let's pray over this word today. Father, God, I thank you that breakthrough already happened in worship. God, I thank you, Lord, that breakthrough's in this house. What a simple message. God, Lord, it's not complicated. Lord, who we are attached to this summer, who we, con- who we connect ourselves to, God, is going to bring breakthrough in us and breakthrough through us. God, do something powerful. Open up our eyes and our ears. God, plant this word deep in our heart. God, make us better. In Jesus' mighty name. If you love him, shout amen. Come on, let's celebrate a little bit. Come on now. So when, it, when, I, when I read scripture, I look at, um, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he asks them, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And, and Peter, the fisherman, stands up and he says, hey, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. And Jesus' response to his confession of faith, to his faith is this, I tell you, Peter, you're Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church. The rock, Peter's name means rock. That rock was the confession of his faith. Upon his faith, upon believing. How many believe? Come on, clap if you believe. Come on, clap louder if you're a believer. See, on what we believe, he said he would build his church. And that the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Guess what? This church is not my church. This church is his church. And he's the one that's building it. If you look around, he's building it. But you got to realize that the church is not this structure that we have right now. This structure, we may build another one. We may add another campus. There's a lot of things that we feel like God wants to do in the future. But you know something? The church is not a facility. The church is the imperfect people on your row. Hello? Come on, look down your row. Come on now. There ain't nobody perfect down there. Hello? Some of like, don't look at my hair now. Come on now. It's not, I don't have a good hair day. <laughs> Listen, some of us, we, we, we look at things through a certain lens, and the lens that we look to a lot of times is the lens that society gives us. And society wants us to live up to a certain mandate or a certain level, and Jesus didn't come for a certain mandate and a certain level. He came for people. He came for messed up, broken, uh, jacked up people that just need to experience him. And he said, I'll build my church. He's still building his church. Community is not perfect, but community is God's plan. If we alienate ourselves and isolate ourselves because we don't like the people that are on a row, guess what? People will frustrate you, people will discourage you, people will hurt you, people will say things to you. They talk about my jeans all the time. Get over it, I like skinny jeans, especially the ones that got spandex in them, come on now. But I'm just telling you that, that yeah, there's too much information for some of you in this world. They'll be like, oh my goodness. Oh. Hey, it's like wearing meg- meggings, you know what I'm saying? I cannot believe I went there, but here we go. What I'm saying is this, people are what Jesus came for. So you got to get over yourself and realize that you are God's plan. So say this with me. I am, come on, say it like this, I am am. God's plan. plan. The moment that we realize that we are God's plan, we are God's church, that's the moment that what's on our lives, we have this revelation that what's on our lives and in our lives isn't just for us, it's for the people around us. It's for the community around us. It's for the people at Walmart. It's for the people at the Target. It's for people at the gas station. It's for people at the public school, for that teacher who has lost her mind. It's the end of the year. It's for her. So what's on you and in you has got to make a difference in the world around you. So you gotta realize that that the greatest part of who we are is who's inside of us. He's he's, He's like the captain of our team, you know what I'm saying? He's the one that makes everything happen. He's the one that we trust in. When I was in elementary school, we played this amazing sport called kickball. Anybody ever play kickball? Wave at me. How many love kickball? But how many's never played kickball? Oh man, in the first service, there were two people that never played kickball. Pastor C's like, let's go right now. Come on now. He's competitive on an edge. I'm like, I'm like, okay, so we played kickball, but there was one kid in our elementary school that he could kick the ball to the moon. I'm telling you, if he got up, it didn't matter what it was, home run every single time. Boom, he'd kick it so far you could never see it. He'd be like, it'd take a week to get it because you're in elementary school and you're like, 
can somebody please put him out of the game? Hello? Because he was the game changer. He was the one that, that made everything happen. So we would be like, all right, let's, let's draw teams. Who's going first? His name is Zion Williamson, okay? <laughs> if you're in the NBA, you understand what the, the draft that just happened. Everyone in the entire NBA planet was sinking everything, and all our New York Knicks fans are just depressed right now. I'm just looking at you. There you go. Because they didn't get God's gift to green earth that could jump three feet over the basketball hoop, and he was the LeBron James of today. Now, here's what I'm saying. If we look at basketball, if you look at the finals that are happening right now, some of you are like, I have no idea what's happening. Let me help you out. If you look at the finals right now, if you take one or two people off of each one of those teams, everybody else is average. You have no idea is going to win. Those one or two people change the game in every way, unless you're the Lakers. They change the game in every way. I'm sorry, LeBron fans, but, but when, when it comes to, I just like watch, I don't like watching throughout the year. I like watching the, the playoffs. Why? Because they kill each other for, for like, for, for all those minutes. And it's just, it's exciting because it comes down to like 1.3 seconds, boom. And uh, yeah, the guy in Golden State wins every game. You know what I'm saying? He just walks away and we're like, okay, whatever. But, but what I'm saying is this, once we realize that the greatest part of who we are is not us, it's Jesus in us that he, he's the one that makes us great, he's the one that, that can handle anything and everything that we work through our lives, then we realize that the game changer lives inside of me. That when he lives inside of me, he doesn't just make a difference in me, he makes a difference in the community around me. If you look in the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter two, the Bible says this in Acts chapter two, uh, verse 42, that all the believers, how many believers do we have? Clap for your believer. They devoted themselves to a couple things. They devote themselves to fellowship, to sharing in food, pulled pork sandwiches, and to uh, and the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So they, they devoted themselves to these things, and here's what happened. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. The moment that the church realized that we're in this together, we're not, a, this is not a one man, this is not the PGA, okay? This is a team sport. When we're in this together, we're a community together, guess what? supernatural things happen. It says that the apostles performed signs and wonders. When the church gets together, that's when God shows up and does great things. How many want God to do greater? And I'm looking forward to the day that people get out of wheelchairs that people see for the first time. I'm looking forward to the day that, that people, I, we see it right now. People go to the doctor and are like, man, I had cancer, but it's gone. They don't know where it went, but it's gone. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I mean, we pray and we believe that way. I just believe that, that when we look at scripture, that the most powerful thing that takes place, it takes place inside of community. We're not in this alone. There's somebody in here that feels alienated and isolated. That's the enemy's plan to keep you from God's plan. The enemy's plan is to, is to, is to put you in an introverted body like your pastor. I have an introverted mind. I like small settings at times. I love to preach, but I like small settings. I'm just telling you, I'm introverted in, in every possible way. But the moment that I put myself in the place where, where I'm in community, that's where I start to grow. That's where I start to see God flourish. That's when I start to see my comfortable place is a quiet place. Sitting on the couch, watching the NBA. Nobody else is around. Nobody can yell. The dogs are asleep. You know what I'm saying? It's, just, it's a comfortable place. But the moment that you realize that God didn't call you to be comfortable, he called you to community. Community's not comfortable in any way. Why? Because we're different. Look at that person next to you. Aren't you glad that they don't look like you, dress like you? And uh, that some of you are like, yeah, they do, but hey. Look at, look at Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Potiphar, when we look at this, Potiphar is an Egyptian, and the Egyptians were the enemy of the Israelites, and Potiphar buys this Jewish guy named Joseph, and when he buys him, he has no idea what he just added to his life. He has no idea who's gonna come live in his house. He brings this guy that he buys. The Bible says that, that Potiphar sees the hand of the Lord on his life, and he brings him into the house, and he brings the stranger in his house, and he realizes what's on his life is bringing favor to my life to the point that I'm gonna put him in charge of everything. I'm gonna put this guy in charge of everything. I'm just gonna eat, you know what I'm saying? I'm just gonna kick back and eat because he's gonna handle it all because everything is, is in his hands. He had no idea that when he paid what he paid for Joseph, that he would get what he got. 
See, some of us, we, we, we gauge things based on price. You ever had sticker shock before? You, you see a car, you're like, I want that. And you go up and look at it, and then you see the number, you're like, I don't want that car. You know what I'm saying? You look at a boat, some people buying boats, they're like, I want that boat. And you get that boat, you're like, no, I don't want that boat. I'm one of those people, I like shoes, you know what I'm saying? But, so that's I, I go to a certain store, and, and I, I'll look through the, I'm like, oh, I like these shoes, and I pick them up. And then I look at the bottom, and I see the price, like, oh, I don't like them that much, you know what I'm saying? That's called sticker shock. Then I take a picture of it, and I look on Amazon and try to figure out what looks like it or what is like it and, and a different brand, and I get what I want, you know what I'm saying? I have several pairs like that. Why? Because I believe in saving money. The problem is, if all we see is the price tag when it comes to community, we miss the value. Some of us gauge the price of what it is. It's gonna cost me time, it's gonna cost me energy, I gotta hang around a little longer, they're gonna ask me to do something, I'm just gonna be, you know, we, we, we put this price tag on it. Let me help you out. Community has a price tag to it. Community has a price tag to it. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying Jesus paid the ultimate price so that you can be in community. So it's, it's, I get to do this. I get to hang out. I get to serve. I get to give. I get to enjoy these things. Why? Because he already paid the price so that I could be with these strange people that I have no idea who they are. And you want me to get to know them? No, yes. Why? Because the strongest part of who we are is who we are together. Not just the people we're comfortable with. Come on now. Some of y'all need some loud people in your life. Some of you need some quiet people in your life. Some of you need some... Let's go on. Okay, so what am I saying? It costs you something. Uh, I, I live in a, in a community, and the community I live in has this thing called an HOA. <laughs> it's a homeowners association. And, and sometimes, I've, I've been a part of several of them. Some of them, they get in arguments at the, at the homeowners association meeting. I've been to those going, okay, I'm the pastor. I don't tell them I'm a pastor. And then I watch them people, I'm like, they're crazy. You know what I'm saying? They, the first homeowners association meeting I went to, they like fought in this meeting. I'm like, are you kidding me? Over nothing. You know what I'm saying? The color of our garbage can, or you can't see my garbage can, or whatever. You know what the homeowners association is supposed to do? Protect the value of my home, because it's my investment. I bought this house. I want them to protect it. There's people that are anti homeowners association things. I'm one of those people that I really don't care for what they do in every way, but you know something? They have a pool, they have a workout room, they take care of the streets, the lights, and all that stuff. I don't have to worry about all that stuff. I live there because I want to protect it. When I lived in Lakeland, before we came to be your pastors, we had a homeowner association, and, and we lived in this neighborhood. They were building houses everywhere, and there was nobody around us, and then boom, they built this house next door to us. I'm like, whoa, we got neighbors, you know what I'm saying? It was like awesome. And then the people that moved in, they put this huge privacy fence around the back of their thing. I'm like, they must have dogs. No, they dug up the entire backyard and made a garden. Not a garden. They made a farm. I'm telling you, in the middle of the city, they made a farm. I'm like, that's awesome. Look at that. I'm like, does anybody, you, the only people that could see was me, because I could see from the second story of my house looking down. What in the world? But look at what they're planting, the whole side. I mean, it was a massive vegetable garden. I'm like, Oh, I love these people. Can I have some of your vegetables? And, and then they started constructing uh, something. And I'm like, I'm like looking at them hauling all this wood and, and roofing shingles and, and built trusses. And I'm like, what are they building? You can't build that. And it went like 15 feet into the air. I'm saying it was a hut. I mean, it was a how, we called it the chicken coop. Man, they're building. I said, we'd sit back and go, I think they're going to put chickens in there right here in the middle of the seat, or maybe some hogs. I don't know. They're putting something in there. They're like, I'm like, why would you buy into a community like this and build that? Everyone's, I'm like, mm, you call the homeowners. They're like, whatever, whatever. They waited until these jokers built the thing completely. And then they went up and said, and we had gone, I asked the guy that used to live there, we were laughing about it in the community. He's like, he's like yeah, they made him take that sucker down. <laughs> why? The reason why is because they were protecting the value of the house. Jesus died so that he could protect the value of your house. Your house is you. He didn't die for a piece of you. He died for all of you. You can't sell out to something else. You've got to give your life to Jesus. How many believe that's good? Come on now. And when I give my life to Jesus, i got to realize that, guess what? He's got a plan for me. He's got something for me. It's called community. Community does have a price tag to it. He paid it so that I can be involved. I've had people tell me this, even here in church. I don't know if they're here today, but, but I've had several people tell me, Pastor, 
I just can't get connected at church. I just, I just, I just feel like I'm not in. I'm just not a part of that group. And I'm like, what group? They're like, people that do that. Stuff. I'm like, I'm like, you ask anybody in this room. I could have them raise their hand now. How in the world did you get connected? How in the world did you, did you just kind of become a part of this family? They'll tell you this. I showed up. My question for you is, do you show up? Not just, I show up. I'm here every, like, fifth week, you know, and I can't get connected. I'm like, that's not on me. Hello? I'm your pastor. I'm here to help you find community in this thing. We have two experiences on Sunday, one on Wednesday, and in the fall, we'll have groups that meet all over the place. Why? Because we want you to become a community of faith that's vibrant, that's growing, so you don't feel disconnected in this thing. It's all about what? Showing up. That means you got to stay late. I have a friend that pastors a church, and he always says, if you linger longer, then you find health in the church. You stay around. If you find your pastor, guess what? I'm one of the last people to leave here on Sunday. It's usually not because I don't have something to do. It's because I just like talking to people. I will go to some meetings this week where there's all these pastors, and my wife will tell you, we're some of the last people to leave. Why? Because I just believe that, that someone may be able to add to me, or I may be able to add to them, and I'm just, I just enjoy that community. Some of us are looking at the ceiling. <laughs> We come in 15 minutes after the worship starts and we leave when the altar call is given. And we say, I don't feel connected. And my answer to you is this, what's next? Faith has a next step. We believe that this so much that we have a pastor that we pay on staff to help you find community, to help you find a place that you serve. I always tell people, you wanna get connected? Join a team. This is Sizzling Summer, it's season two. Join a team, jump in, jump in once a month, twice a month, every day, whatever, during the week, outside the week, whatever, because there is a place for you to become a part of so that you can grow, not just grow, but be connected to people so that you can add to somebody else's life. Our goal is not to just build a bunch of teams. Our goal is to build your life and build your faith so that you can build somebody else's faith. Do you believe that's good? God wants us to be builders. So when it comes to any relationship, you look at any relationship, you can have a relationship with anything or anybody and you'll realize a couple of things. It will cost you time, it will cost you energy, it'll cost you, you know, just, just all kinds of things. Just, it'll cost you emotionally at times, why? Because you put yourself into it. If we really wanna be everything that God wants us to be, then spend more time then spend more energy, then take a step closer towards him. You might say, I just don't feel comfortable. Guess what, I said it earlier. Comfort is not what God's after, he's after community, and you're a part of it. We are the church. How many know that the church is powerful? <laughs> church is not dead, the church is moving, the church is alive. And when we look in the story, realize that, okay, my breakthrough is found in community. The simple truth of that is that, that if, if all we can see is the price tag, then we could miss the value of community. So if my breakthrough is found in community, then my blessing as well is found in community. Look at what happened to this guy named Potiphar. In chapter 39, verse two, Potiphar's blessing was not tied to Potiphar. Potiphar's blessing was not tied to his ability. Potiphar's blessing was not tied to the position that he was in. He was the captain of the guard. He was a wealthy individual. He was a person that, that brought troops together that protected Pharaoh. Potiphar was blessed because of Joseph. Look in verse two, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived inside the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Potiphar puts Joseph in charge. How did he see that Potiphar, how did Potiphar see that Joseph continued in the Lord? How did Potiphar relate Wait a minute, he's blessed because of what? Guess what? Joseph never put his faith on the shelf. Joseph never gave up on his faith. His faith was lived out as a slave. His faith was lived out in the pit. You'll find if you read on in verse 39, his faith is lived out everywhere and anywhere. He still pursued God in every way, in the toughest times, in the greatest times, because why? God gave him a dream. 
And the dream was that God was going to do something great. So where he was right now was just what? It was just a pause in the situation. It was just a time for him to, to serve God. And in serving God, God gave him success in everything that he did. And not just him, but Pharaoh's as well. Verse 5, it says, from that time on, from that time, he put him in charge of the household and all that he owned. And the Lord blessed the house of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything. Can you say everything? everything. Pastor Steve, you can come. Can you say everything again? Everything. See, we want God's blessing on our lives. It's hard to have God's blessing on our life when we choose not to live in community. Let me say that again. It's hard to have God's blessing on our life if we choose not to live in community. Jesus didn't die so that we could just get on a bus and go to heaven. He died so that we could be a part of this thing called the church. And the church is the fastest growing, most powerful force in the entire universe. The God of the universe that did what he stood over heaven and said, you know something? I'm just gonna speak into nothing and boom, there the earth is gonna be. And then he took up some dirt off the ground. He forms it and breathes into it and says, I'm gonna make it alive. Then he looks around and he starts making all these animals and puts animals on the earth and puts vegetation on there. He keeps bringing all these animals to Adam and says, name them, name them. I don't know where he came up with the cockroach, but he must have said, what is that thing? That's a roach, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, how in the world did, did he do that? Like, guess what? I'm not God. That's one of those things one day I'm like, hey, God, how did you, you know, do that thing right there with the cockroach? Come on, it don't need nothing. You know, but, but that right there, that's all it needs. You know what I'm saying? That, that spider, you know what I'm saying? Like, like what good is it? Hello? Whew. Then he looks at man and he says, man, it's not good for you to be alone. Let that sink in. It comes to your faith. It's not good for you to be alone. It's good for you to be in community. And he takes a part of man, his rib, right out, and he forms the most amazing species on the planet, the one that everyone's still trying to figure out. You can laugh, it's okay. It's called the woman. Hello? She's the most complicated, intricate, emotional, passionate, loving, Beautiful. She's the most beautiful thing on planet Earth. Hello? Why? Because God made you out of something. He made you out of man. Why? Because he knew that man needed relationship. It goes all the way back in the garden. God said, you need relationship. You don't need to be on the sun. It's not just your family. You're like, I got a family unit. We do community together. Guess what? That's your family community. You need this community called church. You need to be a part of this thing called church. Why? Because they need you. They need to see your family. And they can do what? They can add to you. He pulls it out of man. He says, it's not good for you to be alone. He creates this thing called relationship. The blessing that was on Potiphar was due to the fact that Joseph served God and lived in his house. And Potiphar recognized it. Some of you are trying to figure out how to get that person in your house saved. Some of you trying to figure out, I'll just, I'll just make them go to church. I'll just do this. I'll just push them. I'll just tell them, you're going to go to hell without Jesus. Let me help you out. Why not serve God, love God, pray, worship, do everything you possibly can so that God's favor can be on your life and they can recognize what you have is what's missing in their life. It's the relationship. It's the missing piece. That's why God pulled the rib out of Adam so he would always remember that it was a part of him. We need to be together in this thing, and it's called community. Community is not perfect. If you're looking for a perfect church community, guess what? There is none. Why? Because there's people. Whenever there's people there, there's always issues. There's always things. If you haven't figured it out, your pastor is not trying to please anyone. That's why I wear skinny jeans. I'm trying to please my Jesus. I want him in the room, and he's the only one that can change anyone. So you gotta get to the point that you put aside yourself and realize, I need the people around me. God gave Joseph a dream, and in giving him a dream, he created this community that people around him were blessed. God wants to do something in your life so that his presence can show up in the world around you. If you look in the book of Acts, it says that signs and wonders followed what 
followed the community relationship that they had, followed the community that they lived. Today, around the town, I'm just telling you, you can get healed in the parking lot, you can get healed at the coffee counter, you can get healed in the bathroom, that happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, guys like, I got healed, cancer in the bathroom. How awkward is that? Come on now. God doesn't care about the place, he cares about the person. Just get beyond yourself and say, God, I'm made for this. God, I'm made for this. Come on, let's stand to our feet today. Maybe you need to say, God, I'm made for this. God, I'm made for this thing. Lord, I'm made for this. Jesus, I'm greater because of you living in me. My breakthrough is found in community. Can you just, can you slip your hands? I know that we prayed for miracles. Maybe right where you're standing, right now in the midst of this moment, you just realize that my miracle is in the community that's around me. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, that Lord, that when we lift our hands, God, you're there. When we trust you, you're there. Come on, one more time. Reach up as high as you can and say, God, God, I reach my hands to the heavens. I'm not reaching to a person. I'm not reaching to a building. I'm not reaching to a man. Jesus, I'm reaching to you. God, I reach my hands to the heaven because you are the one that I trust in. Come on, just tell him, Jesus, I trust you. God, I trust you. Come on, trust him a little bit. Jesus, I trust, I trust you, God. I reach my hands to the heavens. I lift my eyes. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can check us out at OceanwayAG.com and click the gift tab. You, my rock, my healer, I trust in you.